Releasing in the ancient year of 2006, Oblivion is a gaming classic. 18 years later, it's still one of the best open-world RPGs out there. But when there's a discussion on why the game's good, people mostly bring up the side quests, characters, or gameplay. In fact, Oblivion's main quest line is written off as just another mediocre Bethesda story, fitting to be experienced last before you shelf the game for another two years. But that's my point. Oblivion's story is much better than you think. It could even be regarded as one of the best main quest line for open-world games. So strap in and join me on a trip down Boomer Lane as we examine the brilliant story of The Elder Scrolls 4 Oblivion. But before we begin, thank you so much for watching. I was born 87 years ago. For 65 years, I've ruled as Tamriel's emperor. But for all these years, I've never been the ruler of my own dreams. I have seen the gates of oblivion, beyond which no waking eye may see. Behold, in darkness, a doom sweeps the land. The game begins with Emperor Uriel Septim giving an ominous monologue, hinting at an incoming threat from the Plane of Oblivion. A bit of Elder Scrolls lore in case you didn't know. In this universe, there are these divine beings called the Daedra Lords. They are worshipped as gods, each possesses their own world. The looming danger that Uriel Septim saw in his dream would be from one of these worlds, we just don't know which one yet. The year of Akatosh 433. These are the closing days of the Third Era, and the final hours of my life. The monologue ends with what sounds like the Emperor's final words, as if he has seen his own death. Then, the camera zooms in on a prison cell. After customizing your newest abomination, the game starts with the Emperor fleeing from unknown attackers. My job right now is to get you to safety. Coincidentally, the escape route lead to the outside of the Imperial City, where you are being imprisoned at, goes right through your cell. What's this prisoner doing here? This cell is supposed to be off limits. Stand back, prisoner. We won't hesitate to kill you if you get in our way. The Emperor, upon recognizing you, makes a grim remark. You are the one from my dreams. Then the stars were right, and this is the day. Gods give me strength. From the monologue earlier, it's safe to say that Uriel Septim has foreseen his death in his dreams, and somehow we are a part of it. Then the guards open up the passage, allowing you to follow them at a distance. Looks like this is your lucky day. Just stay out of our way. This is a pretty lengthy combat tutorial, where you fought rats, zombies, and goblins. A lot of goblins. After all that, your path converges with the Emperor again, so he decided to let you tag along. He can help us. He must help us. What's the harm in having another able body to fend off the assassins? If you loot their corpses, you'll find out the name of the organization, the Mythic Dawn. I like to believe that Good Mythical Morning got their name from this. As you travel with the Emperor, you will help him defeat multiple groups of Mythic Dawn members, only to come to a dead end. It's a dead end. What's your call, sir? As the remaining two guards made the last stand outside, the Emperor gave you the Amulet of Kings and a task, giving it to Joffrey at Wainan Priory. Find the last of my blood and close shut the marble jaws of oblivion. Then, an assassin came out from a fake wall and killed the Emperor. Dispatching this one, and you'll have a talk with Boros, the only surviving member of the Emperor's Guards, about what to do next. Nothing I ever heard about, but Joffrey would be the one to know. He's the Grand Master of my order. Although you may not think so to meet him, he lives quietly as a monk at Wainan Priory, near the city of Coral. Here you also finish the character creation by choosing or creating your own class. 
Just like Morrowind, Oblivion starts off with you being a prisoner. The reason you were arrested and jailed was never specified. Perhaps the gods have placed you here so that we may meet. As for what you have done, it does not matter. Personally, I really like this sort of beginning. Having a blank slate to begin with in an RPG opens up a lot of options for roleplaying. Making a character is not as intimidating as in Morrowind. You don't need an Excel sheet to play the game. Huh? But it's also not as freeform as Skyrim where you have to start from square one with every skills. You can choose from the preset classes or create your own class. This character creation struck the perfect balance between roleplaying and optimization. Of course this doesn't include the absolutely broken leveling up system because man you gotta do some weird maneuvers. Holy shit I wrote maneuvers correctly first try. You don't need some weird maneuvers to level up effectively. Just like any good story, Oblivion starts with a crisis, and a huge one at that. If the Septim bloodline ends here, there will be no one to light the dragon fire. When an emperor is crowned, he uses the amulet to light the dragon fires at the Temple of the One in the Imperial City. That fire is the only mean of defense to keep the Daedra from Oblivion planes out of this world. It may be that the dragon fires protected us from a threat that only the emperor was aware of. On a smaller scale, the Emperor has just been assassinated and no one but you knows that he has a secret son hidden away. Besides that, there's at least one secret organization actively scheming to destroy the world. It's only logical that the Empire will descend into chaos for at least the near future. It's up to you to help solve this crisis by delivering the amulet and find the next Emperor so the Empire and the world doesn't come to an end. Which is a short intro, the game has set the stake incredibly high while still keeping it vague enough that you can't predict the story. And, you know, sometimes the story doesn't need to be super realistic or full of twists and turns. A decent hero adventurer to save the world can withstand the test of time. Exiting out of the sewer tunnel, the world of Cyrodiil opens up to you. Now it's your choice to go wherever you want and do all the side quests. Except we are a responsible protagonist, so straight to Wayne and Priory it is. When you're there, finding Joffrey is not very hard. He's the Grand Master of the Blades, a group of elite soldiers that serves the Emperor directly. You brought me the Amulet of Kings? This cannot be. Let me see it. It's also not very hard to convince him that you were there when the Emperor died, and he entrusted the Amulets of King to you. Who are you? How did you get this? What do you know of the Emperor's death? As unlikely as your story sounds, I believe you. Only the strange destiny of Uriel Septim could have brought you to me carrying the Amulet of Kings. He never told me anything else about the baby, but I knew it was his son. From time to time he would ask about the child's progress. After a bit of talking, he gave you a name. His name is Martin. He serves Akatosh in the chapel in the city of Kvach, south of here. A priest in Kvach named Martin is supposed to be Uriel Septim's secret son, and our task is to get him before the Mythic Dawn finds out about his identity. If the enemy is aware of his existence, as seems likely, he is in terrible danger. Many criticize this part of the story, saying that Joffrey believed us too easily and we could have been an agent of the enigmatic Mythic Dawn. But I think it makes sense. You holding the Amulet of Kings is pretty convincing, as the Blade agents would sooner die than letting that relic fall into the hand of the assassins. The Amulet of Kings is ancient. Saint Alicia herself received it from the gods. It is a holy relic of great power. And Uriel Septim, from what we've seen of him, isn't afraid of death or pain, so him giving up information about his illegitimate son to the enemies seems even more unlikely. With these facts, it's understandable that Joffrey would believe us so quickly. So, off to Quatch we go. And look at that, that's a gate to the plain of oblivion. They've opened one right in front of the city gates. Until that gate is closed, the best I can do is try to hold these barricades. Guess who's gonna have to close it? Seems like the Mythic Dawn has gotten to Martin before us. Seriously, how are these guys so quick? Let's close this oblivion gate, shall we? Boom. Boom. Ah, boom. And done. We take the Sigil Stone to destabilize the gate, and it will close on itself, spitting our hero out. Time to head into Kvach and find our Emperor, if he's still alive. Come on, for Kvach! 
Now in 2024, the Siege of Crotch looks trivial, but I bet this was epic back in 2006 on the Xbox 360. After cleaning up the remnant of the Daedric forces, we open the door to the chapel. And there he is, priest named Martin who's supposed to be Uriel Septim's son. I'm surprised the monster haven't got him yet. Danger, you say? Explain yourself or leave me alone. There are many others here who actually need your help. Okay, now's not the time to act moody, Mr. Emperor. We have a world to save here. On a side note, Boromir having a faith crisis is great to listen to. I'm having trouble understanding the gods right now. If all this is part of a divine plan, I'm not sure I want to have anything to do with it. Convincing Martin that he's the Emperor's son is not very hard. Emperor Uriel Septon? You think the Emperor is my father? No, you must have the wrong man. You spoke to the Emperor before he died? And he told you to find me? I don't know. It's strange. I... I think you might actually be telling the truth. I guess my elven mage is just that persuasive. And I just blasted a realm wharf of monsters back into oblivion to get here, so yeah. Now to finish turning the siege on Quatch. And the Count is dead. Oh well, what can one man do? Let's quickly head back to Wayne and Priory with Martin, now that both us and the enemy knows he's important. You help them drive the Daedra back? Yes. I'll come with you to Wayne and Priory and hear what Joffrey has to say. Help! You must help! They're killing everyone at Wayne on Priory! Oh come on, the Mythic Dawn is already here? Is someone leaking information to them? How do they even know of this place? Good thing Joffrey's still alive, but the Mythic Dawn has stolen the amulet. They've taken it! The amulet of kings is gone! The enemy has defeated us at every turn! At this point, I think the Blade should do an internal investigation, because we are getting outmaneuvered at every turn here. At least Martin is safe, so Joffrey decides to bring him back to Cloud Ruler Temple near Bruma. And with that, we conclude the first chapter of Oblivion. I really like how Oblivion story beats flow into each other. One event naturally leads into another in a believable way, while keeping the action high. But it doesn't feel exhausting as you will get downtime between the big events in the story. You got the amulet after fighting through the sewer, now you get to go anywhere. Deliver the amulet, you go into three intense combat sequences, and then a relaxing horse ride. You get to tackle the story whenever you want and it won't lessen the impact of the story. Unlike a certain game about finding your son that also lets you build a goddamn base. Chapter 2 begins with us investigating the Mythic Dawn. The most urgent matter is to take back the Amulet of Kings, as it is the key to the world's survival. We must try to recover the Amulet before the enemy takes it out of our reach. And now that the dust has settled a bit, we need as much information on this organization as possible. We should make our way back to the Imperial City to meet with Boros, the last surviving Blade agent guarding the late Emperor. You'll find Boris at Luther Broad's boarding house in the Elven Gardens district of the Imperial City. Well, Mythic Dawn got the eyes on him too. Hello there. Listen, I'm going to get up in a minute and walk out of here. That guy in the corner behind me will follow me. You follow him. Probably because they got wind of his investigation. The assassins who killed the Emperor were part of a Deirdre cult known as the Mythic Dawn. Apparently worship the Deirdre Lord Mayrunes Dagon. I've been tracking their agents in the Imperial City. I guess they noticed. After saving him, Boris told us to meet a scholar from the Mages Guild, one Argonian called Tarmina, to learn more about the Mythic Dawn. For this, we need access to the Arcane University. Luckily for us, I got access to it before starting the main story, so we will just waltz right in there. Ah, you must be the one I got the message about. You know of them? One of the most secretive of all the Daedric cults. Not much is known about them. They follow the teachings of Maincar Cameron, whom they call the Master, a shadowy figure in his own right. That wasn't much, but at least we have the name of the enemy now. While looting the corpse of the assassin that attacked Boros, we found the first volume of the commentaries on the Mysterium Xerxes. Xerxes. Yeah, Bethesda went all in with these names. This is written by Mancar Cameron himself, and is used as teaching and recruiting material within the Mythic Dawn. Due to how secretive the cult is, getting a hold of a single volume is extremely hard, unless we're on state business. Find them, eh? 
I won't poke my nose any further. Official business and all that. Tarmina has the second volume for us, but we need to find the third and fourth. Dropping by the first edition bookstore nearby, the shopkeeper informs us that he has found the third volume of the commentaries. I happen to have a copy of volume 3 on hand, but I'm afraid it is a special order. Already paid for by another customer. We can pay this guy for the book, or tell him that he's involved with a treasonous plot against the Empire. What? The mythic dawn were the ones? You have to believe me. I truly had no idea. I mean, I knew they were a Diedrich cult. Here. Volume 3 is yours. What you do with it is your business. Turns out he's got an appointment line up with the Mythic Dawn too, as the fourth volume can only be obtained directly from a member of the cult. I had set up a meeting with the sponsor, as he called himself. Here, take this note they gave me. It tells you where to go. I don't want anything else to do with the Mythic Dawn. Looks like we got a date in the sewer with the cult and Boris. Let's go. I know that part of the sewers well. Why do they have crabs and goblins down here? The room with the table is just through this door. I think I'd better be the one to handle the meeting. You'll be my backup. Keep watch from above in case of trouble. I guess the Mythic Don doesn't like third wheeling. Ah, the jig is up anyway. Let's get rid of these guys. With the fourth volume in hand, we might have a clue about their secret base. You could go to Tarmina for a clue, but I mean, come on, they highlighted all the letters. Just piece them together. The text reads, Green Emperor Way where the tower touches Midday Sun. Going to that location is the tomb of Prince Camerol. There's nothing on this prince so we just gotta think it's someone important. At about midday, the tomb will glow marking a location in Cyrodiil. This might be the lead that we need to get an upper hand on the Mythic Dawn. Time for the super secret infiltration mission. We can just walk in there. After doing some customary stuff, we head into the inner sanctum. That's our guy, Mancar Cameron. He's surprisingly articulate compared to his nonsense rambling in the commentaries. As for the rest, the weak shall be winnowed. The timid shall be cast. You know what would be really funny? If we just walk up there and blow him up. Praise be to your bro brothers and sisters. Darn it, he escaped. At least we got the Mysterium Xerxes. We can't make any sense out of this, but maybe the blade can. This book is rumored to be written by Merun's Dagon himself, containing corrupted knowledge harmful to any reader. Let's clear out this base and head back to Martin. By the nine, such a thing is dangerous even to handle. Turns out Martin can decipher it. You'd better give it to me. I know some ways to protect myself from its evil power. Weird flex, but sure. While he's doing that, we're tasked with getting rid of the Mythic Dawn spies in Bruma. It's not very hard considering the city has a population of 20. Making our way down the cellar, we found the spy's order. Seems like they have found out about Martin and the Cloud Ruler Temple, but can't mount an frontal attack on the fort for some reason, so Bruma is the next target to draw Martin out. Returning to the temple, we got a breakthrough. I've deciphered part of the ritual needed to open a portal to Cameron's paradise. Apparently, the book is the key to Cameron because we can open a portal to him, but for that, we need four ingredients. Blood of the Daedra and the Divine, a Great Varla Stone and a Great Sigil Stone. The Blood of Daedra is simple, which is need a Daedric Artifact. In fact, Daedric Artifacts are known to be formed from the essence of a Daedric Lord. There are statues of Daedric Lords scattered in Cyrodiil. We just need to talk to the devotees at those shrines and we can communicate with the Lords. To keep it simple, I chose Azura Star because getting it is the easiest. After that comes the Blood of the Divine. The Blood of Tiber Septum himself who became one of the Divines. Martin suggests that we get Tiber Septim's armor at Sancre Tor. Tiber Septim was the one that established the Septim dynasty and later ascended to godhood. Searching for his armor is a bit dangerous since the catacomb is cursed by the Underking. We need to defeat the four cursed blade agents so they can purify the tomb, allowing us to grab the armor. Next up, the Great Valar Stone. For this one, we need to plunder the Aelid tomb of Miss Karen and fight the Lich King. And lastly, a Great Sigil Stone. We can only get one of those in a Great Oblivion Gate. Great Sigil Stones are the anchors of Great Gates. The kind of gate the mythic dawn opened at Kavaj. Good thing our gamble worked out. The siege was stopped in time and we got the Great Sigil Stone. And with that, the second chapter of Oblivion is finished. After the climax at the end of the first chapter, the story takes the time to build up our antagonists. The mythic dawn, Menkar Cameron, and the Daedric Lord Merun's Dagon himself. 
The more we find out about them, the scarier they get. Backed by an actual god, the cult's influence and manpower is immense. This is also reflected in the items that we need to gather to get into paradise, Manka Cameron's own safe haven. From doing a favor for Azura to fending off a huge siege on Bruma, the danger of our task increased drastically. As the story approaches its finale, the scale starts ramping up, keeping you hooked the entire time. While serving different purposes, the first and second chapters are incredibly well paced to draw you in and keep you interested. Consuming all four powerful artifacts, Martin's able to open the portal to Mancar Cameron's paradise. But it's a one-way ticket and only we can enter it, since it closes after a single use. I do know the portal I create through the Mysterium Xarxes ritual will close behind you. You'll have to find another way back. It's up to us to retake the Amulet of Kings and take down Mancar Cameron once and for all. Kill Mancar Cameron, and you will unmake his paradise. You know, for a cult leader, this Mancar guy has taste. This place looks beautiful. Also, I'm allowed to set foot here without getting jumped, so great hostility already. There is but one way out of the garden. I guard that path. You will travel that path, and it will bring me honor to defeat you. The people here are the dead Mythic Dawn cultists. Some of them have serious doubt about their plan while some are just having a good old time. Soon we will return to Tamriel to rule over it as lords. You understand now. Tamriel is just one more Daedric realm of oblivion, long since lost to its prince. Yab, yab, yab. You're gonna get clapped anyway, so sit still. To make it to Mankar's palace, we need to cross the Forbidden Grotto with the Band of the Chosen. The cultists believe it's a privilege to wear them, but in truth, they are a marking device to keep those who wear them from leaving the grotto. No one wearing the bands of the Chosen can leave this grotto. The doors will not open, and there is no other way out. Also, there are torches for eternity here, since they're immortals now. No, no, not again. I have a theory on why, but let's save it for later. Here, we meet a very unlikely ally, Eldermill. In his words, he was Mankar's right-hand man and was the one to plot the Emperor's assassination. I was one of Mankar Cameron's chief lieutenants. I helped plan the Emperor's assassination. I opened the Great Gate at Kvach. He was gutted by three peasants during the Siege of Kvach. I was slain after the battle was over. Three townsfolk hiding in the cellar attacked me when I entered their house, hunting down survivors. As thanks for his service, he was made the jailer of the grotto, forced to watch over the torture of his cultists. For my weakness, the master sent me here to torture my former comrades who showed similar ingratitude for his gift of eternal life. Needless to say, our guy is not happy in the least. His proposal? He'd get the ban off our hands and we let him tag along so he can get revenge on Mankar. Seems fair, I'm not really afraid of another cultist. Right, now to face the man himself. You can listen to Mankar's monologue, but if you allow him the time to talk, his two guards will be revived and joined to fight with him. So I prefer to blast him with Fireball the moment I step inside. Just like that, Mankar Cameron is put down for his crimes. You won't suffer any retaliation from Merun's Dagon though. Paradise just crumbles and spits you back out before ceasing to exist. Here we get to see a cool moment with Martin as he puts on the amulet. After all, this is my destiny. And no man can deny his destiny. I didn't really need the amulet to tell me that. I've known it was true since you first told me him back in Kavach. But it is one thing to talk of becoming Emperor, and quite another to actually be the Emperor. If anyone but a person of the Septim bloodline tries to wear the amulet, it would just slide right off. But with Martin, the thing stays on his neck, so at least he's the real deal. We might have a chance against the invasion. If you play the main quest line without paying too much attention, it could be mistaken for another chosen one story. 
But as the plot starts to unravel, it turns out you're not the chosen one, Martin is. He's the one destined to relight the dragon fire and save the day. You're just in the right place at the right time. But then, what did Mankar mean when he called you fate as you were approaching him? Or the Emperor seeing your face in his dreams from the beginning? Again, I have a theory that could tie everything up at the end. The game effortlessly subvert the chosen one trope while still managed to pose question about the plot. Now, time to head to the Imperial City to legitimize Martin's claim of the throne and light the fire. Stop right there, criminal scum! Huh? Yeah, okay, whatever. It's all you, Martin. Martin Septim, on behalf of the Elder Council, I accept Chancellor your claim to the Imperial throne. Chancellor O'Connor! You should arrange the coronet- Chancellor O'Connor, the city is under attack. Oblivion gates have opened and Daedra are inside the walls. The guard is overwhelmed. No. If we let ourselves get besieged in the palace, we're doomed. We must get to the Temple of the One immediately. Holy moly, that's a big dude. Pfft, yeah, I didn't see the red giant behind the text box, Bethesda. Thank you. Martin suggests that we head into the Temple of the One where the fire is, but it's too late. I must reach the dragon fires in the Temple of the One. It's here that Martin offers his ultimate sacrifice. I do what I must do. I cannot stay to rebuild Tamriel. That task falls to others. Farewell. You've been a good friend in the short time that I've known you. But now I must go. The dragon waits. By crushing the amulet, his life is absorbed to summon the avatar of Akatosh, the god of dragons, that blessed the Septim bloodline. After a fierce battle, Mirun's Dagon is vanquished and the dragon avatar turned into stone. You get a short monologue of Martin saying his last goodbyes and the game ends. Wow, what an adventure, huh? Even on the surface level, the story is already epic with memorable characters. Finishing it, I was blown away since I played the Elder Scroll games in reverse order. And after the disappointing slap fest that was the Alduin fight in Skyrim, Oblivion blew it straight out of the water. But I have a theory that would make the story even cooler. Full credit to Patrician TV and his Oblivion video as it inspired me to pay more attention to Oblivion's story. At many points in the first and second chapter, the Mythic Dawn and Mankar Cameron seem almost omnipotent. They know every move we and the Blade could make and counter all of them. They find out about Martin and attack Quatch first. But despite that, why was Martin left alive? The monsters we fought in Quatch could have easily wiped out the chapel, yet they didn't even touch it. If Martin was killed, Mankar could easily achieve his goal of merging the world with Oblivion and destroy it like his plan. Or when the Amulet of Kings was stolen, they had another chance to kill Martin, the Amulet would have been useless. At the Cloud Ruler Temple, they could attack the fort whenever they want, but they chose to attack Bruma. During the siege, the siege engine took far too long to cross the short distance. But the biggest weird detail is that we are allowed in paradise without any penalty. Allowed to kill Mankar Cameron and escape with the amulet unscathed, despite the Mythic Dawn being backed by a literal god. At the end, when the invasion at the Imperial City happens, Mayrun's Dagon didn't do anything much either. He only fought the dragon and lost. All of this seems like bad writing, but what if I tell you? These were all according to Mayrun's Dagon plan. Martin was left alive during the siege and the attack. We were meant to defeat Mankar and retake the amulet, and Martin was supposed to sacrifice himself. But wasn't Meron's Dagon goal to invade the world? How would losing Mankar and losing to the dragon benefit his goal? Well, it was never stated that he explicitly wants to invade the world and destroy it. Meron's Dagon is the Daedric Lord of Destruction, but also of Change and Revolution. The Septim Dynasty started the Third Era with the unification of Tamriel by Tiber Septim, and ended with Martin's death spanning more than 400 years. 
The Daedric gods are known to be very involved with mortals' business, so Meryn's Dagon has ample reason to want to topple the Septims. It's very likely that he showed Uriel Septim the visions of Oblivion. He lets Martin live to witness the carnage at Quatch and Bruma to motivate him to commit to more drastic measure. Martin proposing to let the siege on Bruma happen is a clue on the desperation Merun's Dagon wanted to instill in him. Later on, Merun's Dagon even appeared himself and almost destroyed the temple, forcing Martin to sacrifice himself to protect the world. With that, the Septim bloodline was ended. But why would Merun's Dagon throw Mancar Cameron away? He seems strong and capable. Well, if you listen to his speech at the secret base, it's clear that Mancar's ambition is one of domination. He and his cultists want to rule over the world in place of the Septim dynasty, and this goes entirely against the point of Merun's Dagon. And say if Mancar won, the world as we know it would be destroyed, rendering the title Daedric God of Destruction pretty useless. So when you make your way to paradise, Mancar's entire purpose is to be slain by you so the amulet can be returned to Martin. It's in Merun's Dagon best interest to lose right at the last moment after getting rid of both the Mythic Dawn and the Septim's dynasty. Then the world can be rebuilt so in the future he can then almost destroy it again and again, assuring his existence and influence over mortals forever. When Patrician proposed this theory, it piqued my interest in Oblivion and after finishing it, man he got a point. It's silly that an almost omnipotent cult leader could be defeated just like that and we were able to save the day in the last minute. Phew, that was longer than usual. In fact, I'm surprised I have this much to talk about an 18 year old game. Really, Bethesda don't make games like this anymore. Any case, finishing Oblivion and seeing the complexity of storytelling that Bethesda was capable of at one point makes me kinda sad, you know? But oh well, I'm glad it happened. If you've made it this far, thank you for watching again. Hip thrust that like button for me and bye.